You're listening to the Kitchen Confession Podcast with Chef Mary Mammoliti. I'm Mary Mammoliti, and you're listening to the Kitchen Confession Podcast. If you haven't had a chance, pop over to kitchenconfession.com and check out my latest post, everything you need to know to prep a Thanksgiving meal. Today, we're back at the round table with a couple of new sound bites, talking to Matt Agnew, producer Matt Agnew. But I'm pumped. Thanks for bringing me on with the pun, Mary. <laughs> mm, I love it. You know, I love it's a good okay, pun. Okay, I'll cut that later. <laughs> oh, I love a good pun. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do we got today? Well, uh, starting off today, an interesting article from LiveScience.com. Um, a lot of people who claim to have a food allergy, in fact, don't. Uh, one in ten people in the U.S. have allergies, but more than double that number have actually misdiagnosed themselves. Oh, I believe that. I mean, I'm sure everyone at some point is guilty of thinking that they have an allergy to something because either you get bloat, you get gas. Um, but... do, you, do you have a few hypochondriacals in your uh, immediate circles? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just a few. Just a few. Well, researchers uh, have surveyed more than 40,000 adults in the U.S. Um, 19% of them reported an allergy despite having no actual uh, you know, typical reactions of um, allergies. Uh, you know, you got your hives, uh, nausea, nasal and airway swelling, um, or of course the very serious and uh, very present anaphylaxis, um, which is... Uh, for those that don't know, uh, life-threatening, uh, your airway is restricting, and uh, it's also associated with with a drop in blood pressure. Now, I mean, granted, allergies are a serious thing, and there are some serious food allergies out there as well. But I'm going to be honest. I've been hearing a lot about this lately. Um, not even lately. I think over the last few years, everyone seems to have an allergy to something. And or, or a sensitivity or something that they're not eating for one reason or another. You see a lot of exclusion diets, I think. And that's um, maybe where, you know, people get the idea that, well, I can't eat this, I can't eat that, but it's not always associated with an allergy. Right. But I think they're mistaking allergy. They're crossing over allergy and sensitivity. They're two different things. For sure they are. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is attributed to, I came across this this test that, Alternative healthcare practitioner offices carry this test, uh, local pharmacies. And the one thing that I don't understand is instead of going to an allergist, they're go- they're, they're re- people are reverting to these or resorting to these tests for information. So, for example, you can go into a Rexall, and I think a lot of Rexall pharmacies throughout Canada have it, and get your blood drawn. And for $450, you can get this test done where it um, will identify any food sensitivities you may have. And they'll list it either as low, moderate, high. The problem I see with this test is that it's extremely sensitive. One, it's done on your blood. Shouldn't an allergic or an allergy test be done where it's reactive on your skin? Yeah, well, I'll I'll say I personally don't think I'd ever pay four hundred fifty dollars for the privilege of getting stabbed uh, with a needle. Uh, I'm not big on needles in the first place, but uh, yeah, I mean, when you go to an allergist, um, they're using a applicator to apply several different common allergens. I mean, you, you've got the, the most common are, are shellfish. Seven million uh, people um, in the country are affected by shellfish, and then you got milk and peanuts tree nuts, uh, eggs, wheat, soy, those kind of things. Um, and it, it shows the actual physiological reaction to it. I, I just don't know how much you'd get out of a blood test. No, and this is the problem because I've known some people that have actually have taken this test. And it sends you this laundry list. It's like an endless list of food sensitivities that you, that you apparently have from this one blood test. Um, but what people aren't realizing is there's this fine print right at the bottom of that form um, where it states that this test um, for food intolerance is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. And <laughs> right? Doesn't sound like it's good for a whole lot then. No, huh? other than it's, it's kind of a money grab and should not be considered a substitute for professional medical advice. So again, why are we taking this test? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of sounds like it, it's being used to suss out what you might be genetically predisposed to, uh, maybe something like that. But yeah, it doesn't seem like um, much of a starting place if, if you're trying to identify or, or diagnose a, a specific uh, reaction that you've been having. Like, I'm not a health practitioner. I'm just someone with an opinion. And my opinion is, go see your doctor if you think you are having an allergic reaction to something. For sure, yeah. Well, it's it, it gets pretty weird, too, because um, I learned from this article here that uh, allergies can be inherited, acquired, or lost. It's not just it's not always just something that you're born with. Really? Yeah, for sure. So uh, the article says that uh, major hormonal shifts like puberty or pregnancy um, can uh, cause you to either acquire or usually lose um, an allergy. My wife, Steph, actually, she uh, had a uh, strawberry allergy. Um, she she says that she just ate her way through that one. She loves strawberries so much that she just kept eating them until she no longer had a response to them. Oh, see, I did as well. I used to have a strawberry allergy when I was younger. Really? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that's one that like a lot of people grow out of. I guess. I guess. And again, my allergy wasn't severe enough. I would get hives, of, you know, behind my, I think it was behind my knees and on the inside of my arm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not always like anaphylaxis, yeah. but like, so no, like you can, you can decide whether or not it's worth it to uh, <laughs> power through, right? Exactly. Exactly. But in a, uh, in another case, a patient, um, uh, the recipient of a lung transplant acquired her donor's peanut allergy through the lung transplant, which I thought was just crazy. Stop it. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Also, uh, tick bites can cause people to acquire um, a meat allergy. There's been several cases of that across the uh, U.S. as well. Oddly enough, and I don't know why I know that, but I've heard that somewhere. Next. Moving on. Uh, this one is a little out there for a food show, but, you know, my dog hangs out in the kitchen all the time. So, you know, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll throw her a bone. Ah, see, I ah, love a good ah, pun. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Welcome so, uh, to the pun side. <laughs> <laughs> Why do dogs chew everything? Something else that live science was uh, wondering about. I mean, it's it's something that everyone's familiar with who is a dog owner. I have had dogs all my life. I love dogs, but mm -hmm. uh, they can be tricky to train um, because chewing for them is just so instinctive. It's it's a curious thing for them, uh, and and chewing. Okay, wait. Uh, is it curious, or are they just nosy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit of both. But <laughs> chewing for them is it's exploring and it's it's entertaining uh, for them. So, um, it uh, it's it's a tricky thing because you're trying to teach a dog to distinguish things that they can chew. Because of course we go out and we get them all kinds of chew toys and things specifically for that. But then we scold them for, you know, chewing on the couch cushions and on your sweaters. And I actually have a couple of pairs of sweatpants that have holes in the pockets because I put treats in there from earlier and I forgot mm. about them. Yeah. But they also say that there's something about chewing an item or being near an item that has a human scent. Uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, one, of the, one of the major things that live science uh, says is, is the cause here is that dogs often experience separation anxiety and, of course, just attention-seeking behavior. So um, dogs are pack animals. They're not really meant to be left alone. They don't want to be left alone. And so when they are left alone, you know, maybe they're, they're trying to uh, get some attention or uh, they're, they're just suffering from separation anxiety. So um, yeah, they're they're just kind of acting out, you know. Uh, well, I believe. Well, the acting out, I believe, because my dog, my little Dino, when I had him, he would. Yeah, we called him Dino, and he was a uh, Pekingese, little black and tan Pekingese. Eh? He was so cute. He had a face only a mother <laughs> can love. But he was the cutest little thing. He got a bad rap from uh, other family members because they said he was too he was too aggressive. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> they're territorial. But anyway, he was a bit of a little, you can bleep this out, a little sh uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> because he would chew the legs of the table, but we were home and he would kind of look at you as he's going to chew it. Almost like, look at me, look what I'm doing. <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. That's the attention seeking. It's like, you're not playing with me right now. So I'm going to make you <laughs> chase me anyway. Yeah. But he just, he wanted attention all the time. And I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, yeah. 
but he was a little. So bugger. the article also mentions that um, some misassociations can sort of uh, happen with with dogs. I mean, things like leather shoes uh, mm-hmm. are very similar to animal hide, and so um, you know, dogs being uh, om- oh. omnivorous and uh, predatory, of of course, they're they're looking to chew on some some nice bit of steak there, and you're. Uh, your nice dockers are looking pretty tasty. So oh, I that, never would have thought I mean, that. On the other hand, you, you're throwing sticks for them at the park, but then you, you don't want them to chew on your wooden chair legs. I mean, I never would have thought that. So let's say we're not there while they're doing it, and we walk in after the fact. Is it <laughs> right? <laughs> as it... we always do, you come back from work, and <laughs> you know your sofas and tatters. I've never had anything as bad as that, but I've definitely had. Uh, ruined shoes, as I mentioned earlier, you know, track pants with holes chewed in them. Yeah. Um, and m- m- my one of my favorite things uh, is when you see online, you know, the dog shaming photos where, where they've got a sign around their neck. Yeah. About, you know, what they've done and, you know, they're confessing to the internet. Um, but un- unfortunately, I, I don't I think like what you're that. getting at is, is that um, dogs don't actually have a guilt response. Exactly. That's something that we're projecting on them, right? Um it's that's a that's a human emotion, and the dog's just not feeling that. What what they are displaying is like an appeasement response. They see that you're angry, and they don't know what your deal is, but they just want you to stop being that, and you know, go back to snuggling on the couch, right? Right, right. I get that. So I guess you know, trying to discipline them after the fact, well, after the fact, is just pointless because they're that's not right. going to remember what they did was wrong. Yeah, often trainers will tell you that if if you can't catch them in the moment, it's not. Uh, it's not worth scolding them because that's not going to help your trust relationship with the dog. Um, but if if you can catch them in the moment, you got about like a window of 10 seconds uh, to sort of startle them, you know, get their attention and and then show them what they should do or, or should not do, right? So you, you got to catch them in the moment. Well, okay, I'm going to remember all this. So when Frank and I welcome eventually a dog into our lives. Yes. We're just not responsible well, enough right now. <laughs> <laughs> will you ever be mary i don't know but at some point i'm hoping i will be <laughs> well it's it's great i mean dogs just add so much joy to your life like i said i'm, I'm a huge dog person uh my wife and i currently have a uh, golden doodle named gracie um she certainly loves to chew things and uh, all her stuffed animals that we give her uh mm-hmm. are decapitated oh. she likes to get the squeaker out she tears out the stuffing <laughs> and then she tears their heads off for some reason i <laughs> love it all right, next up, seven insects you'll be eating in the future. This one did not really appeal to me. No, no, no. In a study from uh, McGill University in Montreal, mm-hmm. uh, students won a prize for this study in 2013, the Holt Prize, um, for producing a protein-rich flour made from insects because um, the study showed that uh, overpopulation may lead to increasing trends of insect consumption. It's just going to be the kind of best food source when we crest 10 billion people on this planet. And that's when I become vegan and eat strictly plants. Now, you've eaten insects before, though, haven't you? I have. I have. And then going through this article, honestly, um, it really brought me back to trying them. So, So tell me, what, what have you had? Okay, so I've had crickets and apparently mealworm, which I didn't know until after I consumed it. Someone so, slipped you mealworms? No. So we, we were in Edmonton. Um, lovely, lovely couple own this company, Camola Foods. They uh, Their products are honestly, they're very, they're, they're tasty. Um, if you can get over the bug aspect of it. So I've tasted cricket chips. Um, I've tasted cricket pancakes. So in the pancake mix were mealworms. I did not know okay. that. Yeah. Did, yeah. Is it is it got a weird texture? Like, is there like some other way that it, it kind of comes through? Or no. does it just kind of blend in with the mix? It blends in with the mix because everything is ground. And even the okay. crickets, they're roasted. So you're getting more of that roasted taste to it. And okay. of course, everyone says, like I've said before, umami, which means it's salty. Um, right. So you get a little bit of that, but you can camouflage that. Because, I mean, when you know I was what? there, I... I had to create those lemon scones, and I used the protein, um, the, uh, sorry, the cricket powder in the lemon scones. So if you use enough, enough of a, an acid and a sweet with it, it'll camouflage it. So something like that, I think, 
I could maybe get behind. I'd try that for sure. Um, okay, it's but when would you get into say... the more like Lion King thing where it's like s- described as slimy yet satisfying? Jesus. I don't think so. Number one on the list here is Mopane caterpillars, Mm-mm. which is the larval stage of the emperor moth. Um, these are harvested in uh, regions of, of Southern Africa where it's actually a multi million dollar industry. Mm hmm. I still can't. I don't know if I could just like knock back a whole caterpillar. No. Unprocessed. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, I mean, I had a hard time even wrapping my head around the cricket thing because I knew what it was that I was cons- what I was consuming, even though right. it didn't look like it. There was nothing that resembled a cricket, but in this, but you still knew what you were eating it was always in the back of your mind. So for me to sit back and say, mm, "I'm gonna get myself some cricket powder," <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, that no. won't be happening. Um, but it's definitely something to try. And if you're okay with that and you can get, bu- you know, past it, yeah, I'm sure it would be a good thing. Yeah, were, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, apparently the the protein or the uh, nutritional value of a mealworm is unbelievable. Before before we move on to mealworms, I just want to mention another uh, delicacy um, among many African tribes is the African palm weevil. Yeah. Now it's it's about four inches long. Yeah, I was trying and, to bypass this uh, one two inches it makes wide. Me squirm. No, <laughs> but I find this really interesting because apparently weevils are really easily pan fried because they have a lot of fat content. Mm-mm. So it's maybe mm-hmm. something that would kind of like render well, but I don't know if you can like chop it up and serve it in a way that doesn't just look like a bug with six legs. Would you eat it if it looked like the bug? If it looked like the bug, no. Okay, but Frank did. When we were in really? California, we went on a food tour um, and in Carmel, I think it was. And one of the appetizers for you to kind of munch on were, I think, roasted or fried grasshoppers. He was popping them like Pez. Okay, well, the grasshoppers, no. I mean, maybe that's like, a, you know, step two or three insect. If you can, if you can get your head around the, the powders and the flowers and that kind of thing, you can, if you can square the fact that you're actually eating insects, that's maybe not like a, a huge step. But, but this uh, palm weevil that's, that's uh, four by two inches, I mean, like you're, you're kind of cutting into a softball steak there. So that's a bit much for me, I think. Oh, see, no. I think I just threw up a bit of my mouth. Uh, oh. uh, yeah, not super appetizing. All right. Finally, before we run out of time, I want to talk about uh, this last article because climate action has been making uh, big headlines in the news recently mm-hmm. with uh, with the federal election, of course, coming up in, uh, in Canada. And there have been protests as well uh, in cities across the world um, demanding climate action from our politicians, uh, as well as 16-year-old Swedish uh, Greta Thunberg, mm-hmm. uh, who who was uh, really handing it to international leaders in uh, some, some ad- speeches and uh, UN address demanding climate action. So I thought it would be interesting to take a little bit of a look at um, reducing our carbon footprint in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. So in a study recently published by the uh, Journal of Cleaner Production, Mm -hmm. uh, they ranked fresh foods based on how much greenhouse gas uh, was produced from the farm to uh, your kitchen. Unsurprisingly, meat has the uh, red meat specifically has the most carbon impact, whereas uh, field grown veggies produce the least greenhouse gas. And they measured this in what they described as... um, Uh, carbon equivalent per kilogram. They took a look at all the activities that produced emissions on the way from from the field to the grocery store. Now, they they didn't measure anything kind of past that. So once you get it home to your kitchen, they're not looking at the the fuel or um, any kind of emissions that you're producing as you cook it. Uh, But they're looking more at uh, the farm inputs, things like chemicals and fertilizers, fuel for the farm equipment and irrigation, uh, the amount of water that goes into this kind of stuff, uh, growing your food and... and, um, uh, raising your food. And I'm assuming packaging, eater. transportation, all that, Yes, right? transportation, the refrigeration chain, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, topping the list were beef and lamb at uh, the very top, uh, rating 27 and 26, respectively. Um, and uh, what I found interesting, most of that was due to the methane uh, that the 
animals produced themselves. So what? not all of it was, you know, the transportation and the, the water and the food production and all that kind of stuff for uh, the animals themselves. But it's, it's actually the emissions produced by uh, cows, which is largely related to their diet. Really? Mm-hmm. Um, but experiments are being conducted worldwide, uh, some, some across the United States, in Spain and India, um, to try and reduce the, those, those emissions, the, uh, the animal-related emissions, mm-hmm. by adding probiotics, uh, molasses. There's actually a compound in onions, apparently, that helps, as well as dried seaweed uh, in different combinations to cow's diets, uh, which can reduce those emissions by up to 50%. Oh my God, me and the cows are eating the same diet. <laughs> <laughs> Onions and seaweed. And mm-hmm. seaweed. Okay. So going going down the list here, what I found really interesting was uh, beef and lamb were at the top of the scale, but there was a big step down from there to things like pork, chicken, and fish. Um, whereas, whereas beef and lamb were 27 and 26, pork mm-hmm. uh, is coming in at just uh, six uh, just a ranking of six uh, per kilogram. Wow, that's a huge yeah. difference. Big, big step down. So I don't know about you, but I, I have been eating a lot more pork and chicken lately just because of the, the cost. Um, I find those things to be a lot cheaper than, mm-hmm. uh, than beef. Uh, but yeah, apparently there's a big step down in terms of the carbon footprint. That's interesting because I never would have guessed that. I would have assumed, honestly, that meat across the board would be the same. Percentage. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what or I was thinking. Or the same rating, sorry. Right, and so uh, fish is the least of, of all of the uh, meat and sort of meat alternative uh, category items um, at uh, just three and a half carbon equivalent per, per kilogram. Um, I haven't eaten a lot of fish lately because, again, I, I've just found it really expensive. Um, I, I, of course, really love you know fresh uh, wild Atlantic salmon makes for a really nice cedar plank uh, mm-hmm. Thing on the grill and and uh, but I've found it really expensive all summer. So I think I've only had that just just once. But um, fish, if if you can get it at a good price, is definitely um, the uh, the lowest in, in the meat category in terms of the carbon footprint. It's the lowest, but uh, at times can be one of the most expensive for a small piece of fish. Yeah, definitely. I I certainly thought it would have been more in terms of um, you know if if you have fleets of ships going far out to catch wild caught Atlantic salmon. I mean, I can see why that would maybe increase the cost. Um, but I thought it would have been higher in terms of the carbon footprint. Okay, so the first way we can reduce the carbon footprint in our kitchen is choose the type of meat that uses the least amount. For sure, yeah. Um, the next thing you can do is uh, go a little bit more plant forward. Um, amongst the vegetables, a- again, there's a big step down. So you've got uh, fish at three and a half as well as eggs. Um, so that's pretty good. But then you jump down again to, uh, you jump down a whole point um, to 2.0 uh, is the ranking for fruit and vegetables grown in a heated greenhouse. Um, milk and dairy products at uh, 1.5 and uh, nuts, various nuts at uh, one carbon equivalent per kilogram. So um, you definitely take a big step down when you get into the uh, fruit and uh, fruit and vegetables kind of category, a little mm-hmm. bit in the, in the dairy and the, uh, and the nuts uh, are a good protein alternative as well. But once you get down into the field grown, this is, I think, where uh, um, Buying and, and cooking with seasonal uh, fruit and vegetables is really important because the difference between uh, fruit and vegetables done in a, in a greenhouse um, at two uh, ranking of two per kilogram, the field grown fruit is 0. 0.5, or pardon me, 0. 0.4 per kilogram. Wow. Yeah. So there's there's a huge difference between, um, you know, if you super, super want your strawberries in the middle of February, you know, that's nice, but obviously that's not <laughs> when when they're going to be freshest. So they're either being shipped all the way from somewhere like Florida or California, uh, or they're being grown in a in a greenhouse. And those, those emissions uh, really count for a lot, apparently. So this brings me down to uh, a recipe that was shared by theconversation.com, where we found this article, yep. for spaghetti bolognese with uh, a reduced carbon carbon footprint. So it includes all the uh, sort of ingredients that you'd expect to find traditionally, you know, your your flour and your eggs and olive oil for the spaghetti, mm-hmm. uh, as well as chopped tomatoes, red onion, fresh 
garlic and basil um, for your the, the base of your sauce. Um, throwing in some some grated carrots and zucchini, uh, as well as some olive oil and red wine. That all gives us a total carbon footprint for that whole meal mm-hmm. of one point seven nine. Okay, which is great. It's very low. It's phenomenal. Um, but of course, we don't have a lot of. Uh, it's it's not exactly a meaty sauce yet. Right. So. Um, if you want to add uh, some some beans to that, so you, you could add uh, lentils and kidney beans, and I find um, a combination of lentils and tomato paste makes for a really really rich sauce. It does, it does. That's a nice uh, substitute for bolognese. Yeah. So um, adding the beans and the lentils only brings us up to two point oh nine, which is great still so far. Okay. Now, if you want to add some some good uh, minced beef to that, that itself is worth nine nine and a quarter almost so our carbon footprint is now up to a ranking of 10.94 um but the, uh, the conversation uh has an interesting alternative here instead of beef if you want some meat in your sauce it suggests uh 400 grams of uh kangaroo what ground kangaroo which i'm speechless I'll be honest, I didn't know it's strictly legal. It kind of seems like one of those like exotic imported meats that might get you arrested. <laughs> but it, it seems to suggest that that's the product on the market. So if you can find yourself some nice kangaroo mints near you, kangaroo has a very low carbon footprint of 1.64. I, I'd probably just stick with the with the kidney beans and the and the dry lentils, but uh, yeah. trying to get yeah. a, trying to get kangaroo here, it, the, it's just not going to happen in Canada. Yeah. There's uh, there's definitely some alternatives out there anyway. So this this brings me to uh, an interesting nonprofit that I came across mm-hmm. uh, called Zero Foodprint. It was started in San Francisco and it encourages chefs to promote sustainability in their kitchens. So I can chefs get with that for sure. Yeah. So chefs do uh, a self audit in order to be certified. They need to do a self audit looking at uh, the amount of dairy use in their kitchen. Uh, the the um, commercial food industry is largely dependent on butter instead of oils, and, and dairy has a much higher carbon footprint than, uh, you know, things like uh, like a nice olive oil. Um, so auditing that, along with uh, sourcing more local and seasonal produce, like we talked about, the difference between greenhouse and field grown yep. uh, produce is is a huge a huge step, almost four hundred percent difference in uh, carbon footprint. And when you're going through as much product as you are in a commercial kitchen, it, it starts to make a really big difference, I think. They also take a look at uh, sourcing meat from, and this is a new term for me, carbon ranches. Have you ever heard of a carbon ranch? No. Okay, what is that? A carbon ranch, apparently, is is just a ranch where cattle are managed in a way to reduce emissions and and just integrate better working with the land uh, rather than looking at sheer raw output. Mm. So... I think, again, that really stresses and underlines the importance of working with uh, uh, other local organizations and farms and ranches, um, because, again, that's not beef being shipped overseas or across the country uh, to get to you. That's that's something local, and the, the supply chain inputs are much lower on something like that. Interesting. And, uh, and finally, they, they take a look at... Um, the disposable waste in in their commercial kitchens, uh, things like single use plastics, like straws and produce bags and, and paper towels. Yep. Uh, Katie Millard, she's a Portland based restaurateur, and uh, in his article from Forbes, she says it only took capitalism seventy years to inadvertently ruin the food system. So <laughs> the hope is that if we're trying, we could maybe fix it in ten or fifteen. <laughs> I thought that was a really uh, a really interesting thought. So. Uh, one of those initiatives to sort of try and fix things a little bit is uh, that Zero Foodprint encourages their partner restaurants to add, quote, 1% to un the planet, which is a, a small surcharge <laughs> directed toward uh, ZFP's carbon farming funds. Would you pay like a, a 1% tip on, on your bill when you go to eat in order to help offset your, your carbon footprint? I mean, I... They they say that this uh, makes your meal quote you know carbon neutral. You know, this is this is a tough one for me because I do want to reduce my carbon footprint. However, I don't think me giving a restaurant one percent um, for food that I've eaten based on their ordering choices. So they've ordered from suppliers. They're the ones that can reduce the footprint. Um, 
before it actually hits my plate and into my mouth. Because I'm not at home. I'm not the one making the decision. I'm not the one shopping for it. They are as a restaurant. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, I think I think I disagree with you a little bit here. I mean, I would probably I'd probably pay up to one percent to sort of to offset that. I mean, the the we always ask, I think, as individuals, you know, what can I really do? I mean, it's all about the uh, the the big emitters and and uh, change at such a high high level. But I mean, I I think if um, but do you think throwing we money ab- at it? Do you think throwing money at it would actually change anything or... You know what? I, th- I think so. Because in commercial kitchens, uh, some of those small choices, I mean, it's really going to drive up the cost of doing business for them. And so, um, I mean, whether it's a, a 1% surcharge and they're keeping their prices the same um, or or whether it's something that they just start build, building into the cost of their uh, business once th- these things start to become regulated, I mean, I think it's just uh, sort of a matter of time. I don't know. I think they just incorporate that expense into their um, into their business plan, into their expenses, into their projections. Because I don't think when we do something at home, I'm not charging whoever comes over to eat a 1% surcharge because I'm trying to unfuck the planet. Um, that's, Wait, that's just... you don't charge your house guests? <laughs> no. I think you need to relook at your business model, Mary. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> 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 so this this one percent i mean there's definitely some uh you know differing opinions on it. it it is a um uh surcharge that people can opt out of but uh zero footprint says so far um the response to it has been pretty pretty positive um and they've got uh partner restaurants all across the u.s dozens of uh restaurants who are kind of buying into this um as well as a few internationally. The only one, it doesn't seem to have quite come to Canada yet. The only one I was able to find in Canada was uh, called The Farmer's Apprentice in Vancouver, mm, if you've okay. ever been there. But uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was really interesting. And and uh, whether you're into the 1% surcharge or not, I think it's sort of an admirable uh, undertaking on the part of uh, uh, commercial kitchens, just kind of taking some responsibility for um, it's such a large industry. I mean, it's an 800 billion dollar a year industry in the US. So, um, you know, if, if more and more of them start taking accountability for uh, their carbon choices, uh, I mean, I think that's something that could I do, uh, and I wish collectively they would. make a big difference. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. But to charge us 1%, mm, not so much. I think, we, <laughs> I think we pay enough for everything we do. So I don't know. We agree to disagree on that one. Well, okay. I think Greta Thunberg's <laughs> got some words for you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for bringing all these articles for today's episode. You're very welcome. Thanks for letting me out of the editing suite for a little while. And you know I love having you on, trying to get you here more often. And thank you to everyone who voted and helped bring the topics that we shared today. It's that time we've reached the end of another show. Be sure to visit kitchenconfession.com for more recipes and foodie finds. I'd like to thank producer and editor Matt Agnew, and I'm Mary Mamaliti. See you at the next episode. 